Yep. Okay, good. Um, thank you for not board members for coming. Um, and, and thank you board members for coming as well. Um, I'm Dan Graziano. Um, welcome everybody. Um, every year we start with the quarterly billing, we send out a give back to Stonebridge form, which if you picked up the materials, you have right on top of the materials today. And we're seeking volunteer members to serve on various board committees. And each year, as you can see, we have about 70 of them return. Uh, now, if you consider there are 799 doors here, here, even discounting those members who own multiple units, single owners, widows, widowers, it would seem there are probably about 1,200 owners of property here. So that response is probably a little less than 6% of our owners who are volunteering to give back to Stonebridge. Not a big number. I will tell you I've been involved in a lot of organizations over the years, and it is true that you rarely have more than about 10% of truly active members who take leadership roles in, a, in an organization. But we're still lagging behind that. And our hope was, with this uh, presentation, to draw more people out and to encourage more people to volunteer and participate. Uh, the topic today is, is one that potentially uh, might not be as interesting as most. I blame Tim for not dramatically advertising the free cheese like we did for the Irma <laughs> Town Hall. Uh, where we had about 200 people attending, but um, I, I, I don't think that's the problem. I, I think uh, give back to Stonebridge is almost like that invitation you get to your uh, child's school for their fundraising for the annual fund. You, you just might have something else to do that night. But our committees serve very important roles as advisors to the board and resources for Tim and his staff. And we look to the committees as a farm system where we can evaluate a member's suitability for service as a member of the Board of Directors. In fact, the nominating committee, which I chaired for the last three years, has made a commitment that recommended candidates will have served on a committee as an officer of a neighborhood association or as a leader in some other Stonebridge activity. Today, the board members are all going to speak about their particular committees tell you the work they're doing and what they're looking for from the members of their committee. After that, we're going to discuss a change to the master declaration with regard to the resale fee. That's the fee that when you purchase a house here at Stonebridge, the purchaser generally pays that resale fee and we put it into a reserve fund to be used for purchasing uh, new, new capital items. So you're going to hear about that. And then you're going to get a little brief update on the master site plan post um, our focus groups and where we are with that. So with that in mind, I would ask that you turn your cell phones off and I'm going to call on Ellen Hannon to present on the finance committee. trailing spouses. <laughs> I definitely think I'm winning the other on the, on the over other. Um, thank you. As, as Dan said, we're just going to just talk quickly about the role of the committees that we chair, uh, what we look for in, okay, in members, uh, what kind of skill sets we're looking for, and we're going to talk about, I'll touch too on the time commitment. A lot of people ask that I don't have time to do anything. It's not as timely, I mean, it's not as uh, onerous as one might think. So, with no further ado, and you can take all this home and read this at your leisure with your reading glasses. These are right out of our bylaws. So what the role of the Finance Committee is, I'll try to make this a little more enticing. Maybe I'm the only one that sort of geeks out over numbers, but <laughs> the role of the Finance Committee is to oversee and advise the board on anything uh, pertaining to financial matters for the association which includes the annual operating budget and the capital budget, 
as well as the monthly and quarterly financials. Uh, it also covers um, overseeing and um, deciding on our insurance package for the club, uh, signing the tax returns, tax payments, and anything else that the board financially asks the committee to do. And I have a couple of things that I highlighted here in, in blue. Uh, the second thing we do is assist the strategic planning committee uh, and the management, and if they come up with some idea, something that they want to do, as to how we can finance it. So you can see the, the words I'm using are oversee, advise, and assist. We don't actually sit here and do journal entries and tally things up, fortunately. We have a great staff that does that. And in terms of something like assisting the strategic planning committee, let's say that there's a survey done through the strategic planning committee and the membership at large would like to do something build a tiki bar. I made that up, but just as an idea. The role of the Finance Committee would not be to opine on whether we should have a tiki bar, or what color the tiki bar should be, where the tiki bar should be located. Our role would be, do we have the money, and do we have the money in the right operating, in the right pot to be able to fund um, an expenditure of that nature. Another example was, last year we redid the 11th poll, I think, and so there was a lot of discussion, that was a pretty pricey uh, landscaping renovation, and sometimes the tendency of the conversation tended to veer, and well, can we widen the fairway? Mm -hmm. It's really not the role of the finance committee. <laughs> Our role is to make sure that we have the proper amount of money in the right reserve account. So, and then the, as far as the duties and responsibilities, this actually looks a little weighty, a lot of words here, but I'll go through it. Pretty quickly, again, the, the key words are oversee and assist um, in terms of working with the management for the, uh, the budget. Uh, the other uh, primary responsibilities of the committee are the uh, oversight of the financial procedures of the association. So it's up to us to make sure that our internal controls are strong and that they're being followed. And that gets into uh, kind of what we look for in terms of membership. And again, as I mentioned, uh, insurance coverage. And the last thing we do is we review and approve the external auditors in terms of the engagement letter and uh, who, we, who we engage with. One thing I would just point out on the duties and responsibilities as far as the budget goes, um, in keeping with our uh, focus on good governance, it's, it's important to remember that the budget process is management's budget. It's not the Finance Committee's budget. It's up to management to formulate a budget, which we then thoroughly vet line by line, hour by hour, if anybody sat through this, to make sure that the budget that management is formulating is consistent and is really geared to funding the mission of the club, as opposed to making the mission kind of squeeze and fit into the budget. And that's kind of the role that we play. Um, and lastly, in terms of membership, or second to the last, uh, most of these are the same for every committee. There's just one maybe that's slightly different for finance and that we do look for people that, if possible, that do possess a strong financial and or accounting background, if possible. And again, the reason for that is our, the internal controls that we are charged with reviewing and testing. Um, if you have knowledge of that, it certainly uh, helps. It also helps to spread the burden around uh, rather than just having a couple of committee members that can do that, it's better to have a rotating set of eyes um, on the funds. And there are two other things I noticed when I was reading everyone else's uh, things last night on membership, on the guidelines. They're not here for finance, but I think they should be. And one is, I think it's, I don't know, Karen, what's one of yours? It's legal governance or strategic plan. should be a member in good standing. And I thought I'd highlight that for the finance committee <laughs> because you laugh that the first thing on every month's agenda is the delinquent accounts, and it would be really embarrassing if, you know, which is why Kevin pays that bill every month, so I can, you know I can show up and I don't have to worry about that. Um, and there was one other on the golf committee uh, that they you know, felt that you're, you're, the members should find you approachable and well-respected, so I think that would kind of go for every committee, too. And lastly, the last thing I would say about is the time commitment. This is the one that does take the most amount of time. The Finance Committee does meet every month, uh, generally on the third Thursday of the month at 10 a.m. And meetings last about 90 minutes. 
Uh, committee members will get, we get a detailed financial packet, it's about 20 pages. Stephanie does a terrific job on the departmental variance analysis and we have an agenda. So we've got a good 48 hours or so to prepare. The other time commitment is we do, again, getting back to uh, maintaining and testing our internal controls. We do a periodic review of all journal entries, my favorite, I know. I don't see any hands up in the air on that one, so. But it's good to know, have someone with a background that's able to do that. That really looks at how funds move within the organization through the various accounts to make sure that uh, things are going in the proper place. And we also rotate a monthly review of the bank reconciliations. We don't actually do them, Stephanie does them, but we do go through and, again, um, monitoring the, the flow of funds. The last thing we do is we have a full day, well, it's six hours maybe, budget workshop in, I put down late June, early July. And this is an opportunity for the finance committee to sit with the, the um, Tim and his team, uh, each team member, uh, each departmental head individually uh, presents their budget. And they discuss with the finance committee how they've constructed the budget to, again, support the mission and the vision of the club. Whether it's Ben for food and beverage, or it's Eric on the golf course, or Mark or um, you know Jeff Zink or um, tennis Kevin hello I kind of forget Kevin yeah, they go through their various departments and why they want why they built the budget the way they have and how again how that's supporting uh, the mission of the club and that gives the committee an opportunity to really go through this line by line month by month and ask questions uh, of each uh, team member so that's probably the most intensive thing um, that goes on with the Finance Committee. And again, we, uh, we do now have a uh, pretty swell video conference hookup. I did, I did a board meeting, Jan and I did a board meeting. The board was, except for Jan and I, was here, and we were got beamed into the room, and I would say it felt just like you were sitting right in the room. So again, if you're thinking, time commitment, do I have to be here on campus? No, these things can, you know, can be uh, handled virtually or electronically. That's it. All I have for finance. Me again, Bob Henry is off enjoying his brand new uh, granddaughter in New York. So I'm going to talk a little bit about his committee, Grounds, Facilities, and Security. A lot of words on the slides um, as Ellen went through finance. Grounds, Facilities, and Security pretty much tells you what this committee is about. Uh, it interacts in three very important areas, and it may not sound like it has quite the pizzazz of the Finance Committee, um, but it, Hurricane Irma kind of brought to light the importance of this committee, and uh, while, again, it, it, it may seem like it's occasionally routine, uh, this committee is going to be involved with plans to replace our damaged landscaping, providing a resource and um, advice to management as we go through that. A enhancing community security, if you play golf and you go down uh, the second hole, you can see there's a, the whole fence is gone that separates us from Veterans Park and the dog park over there. So security is an issue with the down landscaping and down fencing throughout. Uh, there's been talk about finding a way to uh, provide some uh, relief for members after a hurricane with regard to power sources, ice, that sort of thing. Uh, this committee last year evaluated the um, need for a whole clubhouse generator. Uh, and that evaluation was that it was too expensive really to try and uh, purchase what we would need and store what we would need in terms of a generator to power the whole clubhouse. But this committee now is looking at other alternatives that there might be for this, uh, this type of uh, facility. And this committee is charged with managing the new, newly named Crisis Response Committee. So that Crisis Response Committee, which is a committee uh, formed this year uh, in, in the wake of Hurricane Irma, uh, that actually is managed by this committee. So, as you can see, the, uh, the responsibilities are, are quite great. 
Uh, the next slide basically says what we're going to do. And, and the committee structure here at Stonebridge has evolved over the years as the board has moved from a hands-on management role that was undertaken right after turnover from the developer to more of a, a philosophy that the, the professional managers that we have hired, our staff, should be managing Stonebridge and the board should be providing that 30,000 foot guidance. And as the board has moved in that direction, committee work has moved in that direction as well. So at least from what I've heard, Gail tells me the House Committee does not at this point in time choose the color of the napkins that are going to be <laughs> on the table. Uh, and likewise, grounds, facilities, and security has moved in that direction as well. So they're going to get a report from Mark, uh, from Tim on the grounds issues. Uh, they're going to get reports from staff with regard to facility needs and security. And their responsibilities are to, again, serve as a resource. We look for people, when we're talking about membership of this committee, we look for people who have some background that uh, will enhance their ability to perform on this committee and uh, make them a resource. So we're looking for people who are very concerned about the appearance of our community and have uh, our willingness to, to deal with that. Um, we're looking for people who may have some experience in the area of security. We have an ex-police chief on that committee right now. Um, if, if, if there's somebody with a landscaping background or landscape architecture, we would look for them. That's the type we're look, of thing we're looking for. So that's what this committee is about. And as I said before, this committee, after Irma, may be involved with some of the most important work being done for Stonebridge over the next two to three years. So it, it's a committee that's worth looking at if you're interested in serving. Thanks. Yeah. My committee is the fun committee. <laughs> Everybody had fun last night. If you were here last night, um, you really, I think, had a special evening, and I'm sorry some people missed it, but 150 people or 160 truly enjoyed the evening. Um, I'm not going to go through word for word what's on the slides because you have that in your hand, but um, the ideal committee member um, would be someone who is social, likes to go out and go to lots of, uh, not mandatory, but go to, you know, a lot of functions, see what's going on, uh, sort of be the pulse of the community and be able to get back to the committee and um, ultimately to management to let them know and be the eyes and ears of what um, people are wanting or not wanting. And a lot of people are not very shy about letting you know what they uh, like or what they dislike. Uh, as a matter of fact, every month in the committee meeting we have, um, I ask the committee members to send me their uh, concerns and kudos for the month and it's always interesting to hear what people have to say, uh, things that can be, that management can take care of or things they haven't thought of, which is not, not very many of those. Um, but it has evolved from three years ago when I stepped into this position where it was a rather difficult time after reopening to um, with lots and lots of people like if you tried to get from the front door to the bar you couldn't really get there because there were so many people that had so many concerns uh, to now it's, it's definitely a much more very enjoyable um, committee to be on. Um, so you're basically a, a, a goodwill ambassador for everybody, uh, helping management understand what people want and what they don't want. Um, I have a rather larger committee, and that is because, and it, there's no set size for the committee. You could, have, the chair can have whatever I think they want, but I tried to get um, a pretty good uh, group from all around, from each community. I think I missed maybe one, but to try and get everyone so that you can see what their perspectives are on what they like and, and what they don't like. Um, 
We encourage members to send their concerns and kudos to us and not to just tell us but also put things in writing and that is something that is kind of hard for some people to remember but it's really important because if it's in writing then we know and, and management knows. Um, we make suggestions on uh, to management regarding the menu, the events, um, the extracurricular activities that go on, the enrichment um, programs. That's a new part for us this year, member services. Um, Katie does a great job of that, with that. Um, so once again, we want people who want to come and help give us the feedback so we can give the feedback so that management can manage and we can enjoy, which is what we are all here to do. The time commitment, um, this year we had eight meetings, or we will have had eight meetings. They last about 90 minutes. They have been on Wednesdays, which I would suggest to the new person, whoever chairs it, to change it possibly to another day in that Wednesdays are such a big night here that it's almost not fair to ask the, the chef and, and Ben and you know everyone who's here to come to that meeting from 3.30 to 5 and something starts right away. Um, let's see. And we, some of the things that we have done are we've gone over the um, dress code a lot. <laughs> so next year, someone can go over the rest of the end. Um, but we are so happy that the pizza oven is here, the smoker is here, and we now actually, if you've read The Voice, have, um, are having a, running a little contest on naming that area over there, the pizza area and the smoker area. And if you win, you would get I think it's two pizzas and a couple of drinks, so you might want to throw in your suggestion. I don't think we have too many right now. We're just running it for a month or so. Um, but that's pretty much, I think, what I was going to tell you about our committee. So. Hello, I'm Jan Fern, and I'm with the Golf and Green Committee. And the role of the committee, uh, if you notice, it starts out with management, develop, and the next one, advise management and the board of directors. And then it says, uh, we're going to tell the people about the things and maintain a program. And so I'll let you read those on your own things, but I have some other things to tell you about how we implement those things. <laughs> Uh, duties and responsibilities of the golf. We do develop policies relative to the program, and we provide oversight for the golf operations, and we assist, I marked, assist in any and all ways possible as requested by the head golf professional to analyze the services and golf operations as well as implementation of the club policies related to golf operations, and that, in a nutshell, is what we do. Uh, we go over and recommend the rules of golf, and I'm going to tell you a little bit how I do it, so we'll go on to the next one. Membership on it is, is that we can make this whatever size we want, but we choose right now to keep it as a small committee. Uh, but we have active participants in all the things, and we try to have a cross-section of, of ability levels of golfers so that we can you know, meet the needs of the people. And we have both men and women on it to represent those categories. Now, how this year and the last year, we've set this up is this we make subcommittees. And so I have a subcommittee of green, rules, handicap, tournaments, SLGA 18, SLGA 9, and men's invitational. And so at each meeting, Mark comes and, and keeps us up to date on what's happening with the greens. And we have lots of questions for him and you know, work with him so that we know what's going on. And then we also have a subcommittee that's a green committee. Um, then Eric comes to our meetings and he brings us up to dates on operations. And again, lots of questions, suggestions, but he keeps us all up to date. Um, then we have on basic subcommittees, we have a handicap of the rules committee. And um, 
we work with making sure that those handicaps are correct. We this year we've got had a handicap booklet committee that we're going to be made a booklet that we're going to get out to people so that people do try to have the correct handicaps. And that's the, one of the toughest things there is, as you know, is to make sure that they do have those handicaps and everything recorded. Uh, we have a tournament subcommittee that looks at the tournaments and then brings the information, makes recommendations to changes of how the tournaments could be changed, and then as a group, again, we discuss it. Uh, we have a representative from the, the president of the 18 holders and a president of the nine holders there to tell us what's happening with them. And then we have a subcommittee for the men's invitational. And again, that person comes in and provides those. And then we discuss and make recommendations and suggestions to the board. The board can, can go from there. Then our big thing is also that we are the ears of the community, the eyes and the ears of the community. And so I have a little section on it called Heard It From The Grapevine. And the, the people bring in, the, the members of the committee, bring in their ideas that they've heard other people tell them, because that's what we're doing, is we're supposed to be representing the golfers out there. And so they bring their questions. Uh, we ask Tim the questions, we ask uh, Eric and Mark, and so that we're informed and then we can go back and inform the other people. Uh, time commitment wise, it's uh, seven meetings. Meetings last an hour and a half. And so we meet about once a month. And it's a active committee. It's a, it's a working committee, definitely a working committee, but a fun committee because we like to play golf. And so we're talking about those things. And one thing, I, I looked over here and I saw the things we're going to be working on, uh, continuing our uh, plan of, for the uh, golf course in the, the 2010, we did the renovation. And we're going to be looking at maybe setting up a program to see what we want to do next and all that. So it's a, it's a looking forward committee and it working with what's happening right now. Hi, I'm Sandy Fleming, and I'm chair of the Communication and Information Technology Committee. And this is the first year that we're a standing committee. We started three years ago as an ad hoc committee, uh, prior to having basically anyone in the member services office. And now we have Katie, who's been wonderful. Uh, when we were just an ad hoc committee, we went through the website and made hundreds of changes. Uh, we also added the bridge and revamped the voice. Um, so, as I think everyone has said, we're really supposed to be the eyes and ears out there in communication. Um, we have a couple uh, big projects coming up. The two big ones, hopefully next year, will be um, redesigning the website. And the second one is working on the new bulk services contract, which means Comcast. When we have the first con this contract 20 years old, there was basically cable. Now there's so many other opportunities out there, and so we'll be working with a consultant to find out what the best services will be for Stonebridge, and this will be over the next year and a half that that will be happening. Um, I think the role of the committee is to maintain and enhance the quality of communications and information services, hardware, and software. That doesn't mean, um, and I'm kind of, going over the duties, we don't need to have IBM people on the committee. Yes, it might be nice, but that's not the idea, because we really are the eyes and ears of the community. A perfect example would be, for instance, a couple weeks ago in The Voice, it said, it talked about the um, opening day for women's golf, and here's how you sign up, and here's a lunch. Well, I then talked to Katie and said, but it really isn't opening day for all women, it's just 18 holders, and it wasn't listed 18 holders. The nine holders didn't realize they needed to give their information to Katie. Katie's phenomenal on putting things together, but if she doesn't know, she can't put it in. So um, the nine holders met with her. Um, now on the website, there's a whole nine holder section with the whole schedule, the 18 holder section, the whole schedule. So now Katie knows to separate, and there'll be two different areas in the voice, nine and 18 holders. Something very simple, but the communications committee member let Katie know that. Duties and responsibilities contribute to the improvement of communications and technology amenities. 
Um, another example that we were working on that Katie's really been working on with through the communications committee is, for instance, putting iPads instead of typed out room schedules in front of the live oak room and the multi-purpose room so it could be changed on a moment's notice of what the schedule is. And instead of having a bulletin board in front of the locker rooms there, there would be a monitor so things could be put on there and even be rotating. So those are the kind of things that the communications committee is doing. We're not building the software. There's professionals that build the software. We're just the ones that can talk about what is important to homeowners communication-wise. Uh, as far as the time commitment goes, the first year we met at least 12 times, and those were many hours because we were going through the website. This past year will be seven times, and I would say six or seven times, although we met with a consultant last month and it was a two and a half hour meeting. Normally they try to make them an hour meeting, but it kind of is adjustable and we adjust to the committees. Um, I think you need to have an, in, an interest in technology and communication and trying to be forward thinking, but that doesn't mean you have to be that. And that's basically the communications committee. Good afternoon. I'm Tony Maglione. Uh, I have the privilege of having the chair of the Community Standards Committee. Now, Peter Fleming told me that the, uh, the real name of the CSC is the Mold Patrol. <laughs> now, we have, we have an unusual role here, uh, and I, I'm going to paraphrase what you see up there. Uh, you know, it goes beyond looking for mold, but I, I think it can be summed up by saying the members of the committee care about the community. Uh, and our job is really to make sure Stan, uh, Snowbridge continues uh, to be you know, as attractive and as inviting uh, as it is today, uh, even after the damage we've suffered from Hurricane Irma. We'll, we'll get that back and we'll just take a little time. Uh, but if you look at our vision, mission, and value statement, uh, you know, it refers directly in a couple of instances to the activities of the CSC. So, uh, this is an important committee in my view. Now, it's not as sexy as, say, the House Committee, or the fan Finance Committee, or the committees you've just heard about. Uh, it's, it's work, and uh, you know, the people that are on the committee are pretty dedicated. Now, as far as our duties, uh, you know, our responsibilities are really uh, outlined. Uh, there's a chapter, uh, Chapter 15 in the Club of Rules and Regulations, that kind of spell out what we have to do, or what we're supposed to do. Uh, and, you know, we care about the appearance of our buildings, uh, we care about our landscaping. Uh, you know, uh, Southwest Florida climates, uh, climate presents us with some unique issues and problems. Uh, and, you know, keeping up our appearance is a constant battle. Uh, you know, uh, with the rain we get, uh, with the growth of our landscaping, how fast it is, uh, you know, we really need to keep tending to it. And, uh, you know, the duties of the committee is to really oversee and, uh, you know, what the condition of the community is in. And if we see some deficiencies, you know, it's our job to point it out. That's not sexy. Sometimes it's not funny. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, we really need to do to keep the community standards up. Uh, now, as far as membership, uh, you know, we're active. Uh, we meet as a committee eight to ten times a year. Uh, we go pretty much year-round. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, we regularly get out into the neighborhoods and conduct inspections because that's really what we're chartered to do. Uh, you know, we, uh, we have to look at buildings and sidewalks and driveways. Uh, we even look at mailboxes. We look at the landscaping. We look at the trees. Uh, you know, every member of the committee has a role. They're very involved. We break, uh, we break up into teams. We break up uh, into neighborhood responsibilities and we go out there and we take a look at everything that's under our purview. Uh, you know, the mission, of course, is a positive one. We're trying to maintain Stonebridge as a beautiful setting. Uh, and to maintain our property values is very important. And uh, I think this reflects directly back on those values. Now, we currently have nine very dedicated members on the committee. And I'd always be happy to have more participate. Uh, you know, if you, you know, I have no qualifications I look for. I just want somebody that has a sincere commitment and a desire to serve their community. That's really all I look for. 
Uh, I, you know, if somebody came in with landscaping expertise, that's great. Uh, you know, but it's not necessary. Uh, you know, I just really want somebody that is willing to put in the time because there is quite a bit of time dedication on this committee. Uh, you know, if you really want to be a hands-on contributor and you care about your community, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to apply for the CSC. I'm going next. Okay, so I'm going to go from what I think is one of the busier committees to probably the least active committee. And I'm happy to report that. Uh, we've had no grievances uh, in the last two years here at Stonebridge. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to report that. In fact, I have very little to talk about here, so I'm going to digress a little bit from what we normally do. We did have one meeting this year, and uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we didn't take the whole year off. Uh, what we did was we, we came in with an objective to modify the process to basically take you know, the potential for a formal grievance out of the picture if we could. We put some kind of a, a well, I, I wouldn't want to call it a mediation step, but uh, some kind of an informal discussion step with the aggrieved party and the person that they're having an issue with uh, to see if we can't resolve uh, their issues before a formal grievance is filed. Because when a grievance is filed, then the duties kick in uh, for the uh, grievance uh, committee, and they're pretty onerous. So you know, we get involved in uh, you know investigating the issue. Uh, you know, we uh, have to conduct uh, interviews. Uh, we attend hearings, uh, and we we have to do quite a bit of work around any kind of a formal grievance. That's why, hopefully, we don't have any grievances this year either. We still got a couple months, well, a month and a half left to run on this, uh, but. It's important work, uh, and it does require committee members uh, who can participate, uh, take in information, and uh, you know reach a fair and impartial resolution. Now, the committee has a unique makeup. Uh, there are three board members mandated to be on the grievance committee, and two members of the community. So it's a small, limited number. And the interesting thing is that I had more. Uh, community members applied for uh, service on the grievance committee than I did on the CSC. Uh, and I, I have two very mature people from the community that I think uh, uh, can perform this role if we are called upon very responsibly. And ideally, next year, uh, you know, when we make up the committee, we'll have the same. Uh, that's really, uh, you know, all I have to say about these committees, and, uh, you know, I hope that, you know, I've spurred some interest, and I'd love to see you participate in any of these committees. Legal and governance. Um, bylaws tell us that those are the things we are supposed to be doing, but I want to paraphrase that just to make it a little clearer. Um, legal and governance is responsible for contact with outside counsel when needed. It's responsible for re reviewing governing documents, reviewing proposed changes to governing documents, and proposing changes to government documents when necessary. Although the committee is charged with being the focal point of good governance issues, these issues, in fact, are recognized and addressed by multiple sources within the community. All committees are charged with assisting strategic planning and management in updating and implementing the strategic plan when appropriate. So this committee also has that charge. First, I'm going to tell you what legal and governance does not do. The committee does not decide the legality of actions by management or by the board in reference to our governing documents. The committee does not decide the legality of changes to our governing documents in reference to the documents themselves or to Florida statutes. And the committee does not interpret our government documents where there is some perceived ambiguity in the documents. That is the job of outside counsel and the committee is charged, along with management, in seeking the advice from outside counsel when any of those things need to take place. So you might ask, well, what does the committee do? Most of the committee's work is actually done before anything is submitted to outside counsel. 
It looks at governing documents. It reviews the governing documents on a periodic basis for relevance. The committee does review changes proposed by other committees. Um, Tony just talked about the grievance process. That process had to come to the Legal and Governance Committee for them to look at it, um, to be second eyes to it, to look at the reasonableness of it, and for the consistency with our mission and vision uh, objectives here at Stonebridge. Um, after that, it had to go to legal counsel to see whether it was reasonable or legal. Um, the committee also proposes its own changes to the governing documents. Um, this year, we, um, we looked around, we looked at trends, and the subject of drones came up, and the subject of motorized vehicles, recreational vehicles on sidewalks came up. The committee developed its own um, proposal to the board about a change to our rules and regulations. Um, that too had to go to um, outside counsel in order to uh, be taken care of. This is a committee that does not meet um, on a regular basis. It is, issue, it is issue based. And if there are no issues, there is no need to meet. So it can be a committee that can meet eight times a year. It could be a committee that will only meet two or three times a year. It just depends on what's happening within the community. And in terms of membership, the chair is a board member. Um, ideally, the committee would include one person with legal background, but that is not necessary because if it has that one person, that person does not become the community's lawyer. So we still have outside counsel. Ideally, the committee is composed of members from different neighborhoods, different interests, different backgrounds, and different life experiences. And the membership usually lasts three to five years. And that's what I have to say about legal and governance. And I believe I'm next again. Strategic planning. I'm going to kind of follow the same format. I'm going to paraphrase what it tells us in the bylaws that strategic planning does. Um, it communicates to members in the board regarding trends and issues. It reviews strategic documents. It manages surveys. And it monitors trends. And I'm also going to tell you what it does not do. It is not charged with strategic planning plans or creating them or overseeing planning activities. It really is based on reviewing uh, surveys and trends. In terms of communications, the committee communicates with the board based on surveys it's received and member input or identified trends. To the membership, it primarily uh, communicates through uh, the website, the strategic plan, the base strategic plan is listed on the website, and it is the responsibility of this committee to uh, make sure that that is up to date and current. Um, it's also involved in periodic town hall meetings regarding strategic issues when they arise. Regarding other committees, the strategic planning committee asks it me its members to become a liaison member to another committee. We try to cover all of the standing committees. This is a major source of information to the strategic planning committee. Strategic plans. Um, we have two parts of strategic plans. We have our what I call our base strategic plan. It was developed in 2011. It was revised somewhat in um, 2016. And it is a plan that stands pretty static. Um, there isn't much need to change it. It is the type of plan that uh, every community needs to be able to run in a, um, uh, a fashion that allows it, it to, to remain viable. Um, it, it talks about good uh, financial planning. It talks about uh, crisis management. It talks about all of the things that are very basic to a community. But there is a second part. And the second part is um, the strategic action plan. And that is put together by management. The strategic planning committee has input in that, in that 
it gathers all of its information regarding from trends and from uh, surveys and anything it hears in the community. And it presents that to management before management puts together its action plan. The action plan changes every year. So it is an ongoing and very viable document. Six months down the road, the Strategic Planning Committee should review how the action plan is working and whether there needs to be any tweaks before the end of the year. The third thing that the committee does are surveys. And the committee is charged with uh, managing whatever surveys take place in the community. Right now, management has three surveys that are, are outstanding. One is a new member survey, which is given to uh, new purchasers. And a year later, they uh, review that. Uh, same purchaser, purchasers are asked to um, review what they, what they did when they bought and whether their feelings had changed about the community. There is also a renter survey. And then there is a quarterly survey that is sent to 20% of the households every quarter. So every person should receive one every 15 months, I guess that is, right? The committee is involved in what the questions that are asked on these surveys, and they are involved in looking at and recording the results and communicating the results to the board. Every four years, it is being recommended by this committee that we do a full membership survey by a third party. The last time we did that was in 2014 with Synergy um, Solutions. We are recommending that um, this be redone starting the spring of 2019 and then every four years afterwards. Now, that means that we're waiting five years to do this next one. However, with Irma, we thought that perhaps um, this community could use a year to kind of recoup before we start asking if people are happy or what they want. Um, finally, the committee is in charge of monitoring for environmental, real estate, and generational trends. It is incredibly important to our community to remain viable, to remain um, a community that people want to come to, uh, that we really try to understand not only the trends in country clubs, but the, um, the wants and the trends and the preferences of the next generation of home buyers that are coming to Southwest Florida. And that is something the Strategic Planning Committee tries to work a great deal with. Uh, meeting frequency, it is my recommendation, I've been on the committee now four years, it is my recommendation that in most years the committee probably only needs to meet four times a year unless something dramatic arises. However, in the year that the full membership survey is conducted, it will probably have to add at least two more meetings to its agenda, first to help set up the survey and then to help work with the results. In terms of who should be on the committee, once again, the chair is a, matter, a member of the board. The membership is open to any Stonebridge member in good standing. Ideally, the committee members would represent, again, different neighborhoods, different interests, different backgrounds, and different life experiences. And the membership, again, would last generally from three to five years. This is an incredibly interesting committee, and I think it's one that is sometimes misunderstood. Um, it doesn't do as much as some people thinks, think it does, and yet it does a lot more in other areas. So if you're looking for a committee that does not require that you be here 12 months a year or participate 12 months a year, and if you like keeping track of what's going on in the environment, this is the committee for you. tennis and fitness as well as the pool committee. Uh, our role is simply to provide input and advice uh, to Tim and Jeff and Kevin and uh, our duties are to kind of keep, uh, keep in touch with our total memberships and again provide that advice and input from the membership. 
I would add one other thing that we, we do do is, uh, is we provide occasionally recommendations to the board in case there's any expenditures like we had with the viewing area of the tennis uh, area this year. We also uh, got a lot of uh, feedback from membership on some issues with that viewing area that had to be uh, fixed and uh, uh, was done by management. So. Um, membership, we've got a large uh, committee. I think we have 14 members in our committee. It's uh, uh, our meetings are we, we have what I've been have, trying to have a meeting just before each board meeting. So we meet like a week before the board meeting so that we can provide any input to the board that we may need, which uh, fortunately has not been anything this year. So, um, Membership obviously should be people who are active in the tennis or fitness or pool area and uh, doesn't require a lot of time. So uh, be happy to have more members on there, in fact, because I think the more members we get, the more input we have. So that's it. Don't we have a great board? Yes. Well, the nominating committee is one. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I do say that, but I, just sitting here today and listening, it, it, this group really impresses me. And uh, I even sent out an email after our last board meeting talking about how how great it was. I mean, uh, it's a lot of uh, bright, committed people willing to talk to each other and more importantly willing to listen to each other and uh, it's been remarkable. The nominating committee was brought back to life I guess about two years ago. Um, actually six of the board members are the product of the nominating committee. The dinosaurs, myself and Sandy and Gail, uh, came to the board before there was a nominating committee. Um, there may have been one on paper but it wasn't doing anything by way of nominating at that time. Uh, and we came in, I think, because there was a sense that we needed to uh, recruit people for the board who had demonstrated uh, the, the kind of commitment to the entire uh, community that, that we want on the board. So we, we didn't we didn't want the single agenda person who was coming in because they wanted to see, um, you know, a, a different kind of menu in the uh, in the uh, grill room, or somebody who came in saying they wanted to adjust the uh, the uh, sand traps on some of the golf courses, uh, some of the golf holes. Uh, we wanted people who looked out at Stonebridge and as an, an, a whole and. Uh, that's been our charge, and, and we've been very successful, I think, in achieving that. With our first year, we actually had five nominees, uh, all of whom were very qualified and quality nominees. Um, last year, we just had three, and nobody complained about that. Um, it was an uncontested election, and uh, it, you know, it, it, it brought us the quality of people that you've seen here uh, this afternoon. So. That's what we're doing. Um, it's an unusual committee and it doesn't advise management on anything. We take advice from management. Uh, we do uh, have Tim on the committee as he's on all committees, but we look to uh, management to tell us what they're looking for. Is there a special need we need to have to address? Do we need a person with a financial background? Do we need an architect? That, that sort of thing. And, you know, candidly, I will tell you, we also get uh, impressions about different potential candidates uh, shared by the members of the committee and also from management. And that's important information for us to have. We, as I may have said earlier, we are committed to uh, looking for people who have served on a committee or in some other role within Stonebridge as a volunteer. Um, and we, we look at that experience to learn how uh, they will perform in that board context because that's important. 
Um, one of the changes made this year for our meetings was, if you've ever attended a board meeting, and I hope you haven't, um, but they looked a lot like this. There'd be a table with a board here, and there'd be an audience, and it was kind of like we were playing to an audience, and, and we weren't. I mean, it was a board meeting. So one of the things we changed this year is we moved out of this room, um, which was way too big for the attendance of board meetings, and we put the, the board in a circle. It's around a table to talk to each other because it's a board meeting. The public's invited, members are invited, and they're given the opportunity to speak, but they talk to each other. So that's, that's what we're doing on the nominating committee is looking for people who want to interact with each other at that level, who understand the role of the board is not hands-on management, that we have professionals like Tim and his staff to handle that, and, and that's what we're looking for. We, we have a very um, targeted uh, activity that we are involved in. So usually we'll start talking in the spring after the election about next year and, and who we have our eye on and different ideas to people that might be uh, someone we should recruit. Because recruiting is really um, our primary focus. And then in the fall we'll get together and we'll hopefully come up with uh, a slate of candidates of at least three for the vacancies that are going to be um, coming available that year. And then we get into, once we have that slate, if you will, we do interviews of the uh, candidates. They've evolved into more of a information for the candidates than it used to be getting information from the candidates. But we do get information from the candidates. We do get an opportunity to kind of double check that they're on their, you know, they're the people we are looking for. And then we actually are the election committee, although that role, since we've uh, contracted out to vote now, uh, and 90% of our votes are handled uh, electronically, that role is, is fairly limited, but uh, we are the election committee. We point the people who are the kind of the poll the tenders that uh, take the votes that do show up on at the night of the annual meeting. So we probably meet maybe four times a year. That's about it. Um, I'm known for my brief meetings, um, although the last board meeting was not brief. But uh, we generally don't meet for a long time. Uh, it's, it's no more than an hour most of the time. As I said, it's about four times a year, primarily in the fall, uh, usually October, November, December, and early January. That's our, our busy time. So that's the nominating committee, if you're interested. What we're looking for, I, I think we're limited to five members, uh, and only one of them can be a board member. Uh, when the committee was created, it was thought that we didn't, we didn't want to be a, a self-perpetuating uh, committee that would just keep you know, recycling people on the board. And uh, that certainly hasn't happened. We've, we've had some nice turnover, and uh, people seem to do their service and uh, move on and uh, move on to other things and let other people do it. So uh, that's an nominating committee. I believe that concludes our presentation on committees. Before we get into Ellen's next presentation, are there any questions as to the committees? Because we're going to talk now about the resale fee and the change to the master declaration, and then I'm going to get a, give a very brief report on where we are with the master's life plan committee. I think that's the order of things, right? Okay. Questions? No? Yes? Um, that's question. I'm just really impressed with everything I heard from each board member. I know it took a lot of time to get this pulled together. It was great. Yeah. Very informative. It, it's, it's fun. It's been fun. Okay. Ellen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, is there a uh, specific email address to send to the various heads of the committee, or is there a central location for all of the recommendations or suggestions that be forwarded? We, we have... Stonebridge email addresses and board at Stonebridge. Yeah, that's that's all the right. Did everybody hear that? No. Board at Stonebridge Country Club dot com goes to all the all the directors. If you address.
address it. Yes, yeah, no, Ross. Are there term, term limits? There are no, there are no term limits now. I, I'm not even sure that we can have t term limits. It's interesting. There are term limits for condo association board members by statute, but there is no term limit for a homeowners association board member. Uh, we think this fatigue provides yeah. the, the term limits we need. Yeah, another. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, Ellen, you're up again. wondering why we're here to discuss this. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background uh, about uh, our proposal, what a resale fee is, and why the, we're making the recommendation that we are. Some of you may recall a few years ago, I think it was 2013, in uh, getting the renovation of the clubhouse done, there was a proposal to change the master declaration, I, I think for that, or to do that, in, in addition to uh, change the calculation of the resale fee, and that proposal uh, failed at the time. So we went back, the board asked the finance committee earlier this year if we would take another look at that and look at what the competitive landscape was out there, what do other bundled communities do, uh, what might we do differently uh, if we were to look at this again the next time around. So. Um, I'm here as the finance representative to talk to you about that because I'm all about the money. So, <laughs> anyway, so uh, I want to talk about what is a resale fee and who pays it. Uh, I've been asked that, like, well, why do we have that? Why do I have to pay that? What is that? Uh, what do we do with the money that we collect from resale fees? What our historical trend of these monies has been at Stonebridge? And I'm going to give you a snapshot. Uh, it's a couple months old, but it's, I think it's good enough for what we need to do here on the competitive landscape, which is what other clubs are doing in this, uh, for this fee. And also we'll go through uh, the methodology that we use to come up with our proposal and what the proposed change might be. So on the first one, what is a resale fee? Probably nobody even remembers paying it. It's a, a one-time charge levy to all purchasers of a home or a unit here in Stonebridge, and it comes as part of your closing costs. I liken it to if you buy a house up north in April, someone says, oh wait, we have to measure the fuel oil in the tank because it's prepaid and you know the new owner has to pay for that. It's kind of one of those niggling things that it's a couple thousand dollars out there. Anyway, it's a one-time charge. Uh, every bundled community uh, does do this. Why do we do it? I was asked that once as well, but the answer is it's in our bylaws, it's in our governing documents. And the wording is here, part of section nine, and it says that the uh, purchaser of any unit within Stonebridge uh, must make a one-time non-refundable contribution to our working capital in an amount equal to the sum of three months base assessments and 25% of the annual club dues for that year. Basically, it's yes, it's 25% of the dues, and the fee is currently. If you, several of you here, I think anyone's moved within Stonebridge, you know, you came in to Carrington and then you went to Braeburn and now you're in Manchester and maybe you're thinking of going to Willow Bend. Well, every time you've done this, you've paid this fee, and every once in a while, I do get a call about, do I have to pay this fee again? Well, yes, that's the way the master declaration is currently written. So we'll talk about that as well. So the next thing is, the more interesting is, how, how are these resale fees spent? And what, what do we do with them? Every time someone closes on a unit in Stonebridge, and at, at closing they pay this fee, oh, which I think I said, based on the 2017 dues, the fee was $1,784.87. Um, carefully tracked by yours truly for every week. <laughs> There's a long list of things that we could do with this money. So that money comes in and it is set aside in a resale fee account, which is separate from our operating account. It's also separate from our master reserve account. The master reserve, that's the $1,030 that we collect from everybody every September. And that goes, basically we're funding the depreciation on the clubhouse, the golf course, and all of our facilities. That's what that goes for. The resale fee money gets set aside and it, it can only be used for 
uh, as I say, to fund purchases of new capital equipment, new items. I want to give you a list of things that over the years what we've done with this. Um, all designed to, again, in keeping with our mission and our vision, we're trying to enhance the member experience here. So my favorite ones are the patio cushions. <laughs> Tim can attest that right when the clubhouse reopened, the first time I went to the bistro, I was like, why is my chin on the table? I know I'm not very tall, but I think this chair needs a cushion. Well, yes, indeed, now we have cushions. It took two years. Cushions, they don't come cheap, and they're new, so they have to come out of the resale reserve. Uh, other things that we've done, you know, more uh, noteworthy and important things, the biggest one I can think of is the Terrace Enhancement Project, which is right behind you. If you recall, when we opened the clubhouse to great fanfare, and everyone kind of looked out and said, hmm, that looks nice, but who wants to stand out there and hold a drink? Nothing to put your drink on, nowhere to sit. No one was using this lovely space that had been created. So I think it was last year that finally got completed. But again, that was a grounds and facilities uh, committee that got together and decided how to lay out the space and what kind of furniture they would like. The role of the finance committee is to say, We've got enough money in the resale fund to purchase these new things. Um, other examples would be after, again, after the clubhouse was reopened, we realized everyone wanted to be at the bistro and there really wasn't enough soft seating outside. And wouldn't it be nice to have another fire pit and another sofa? Again, that comes out of the resale reserve. Uh, the latest things that you've seen uh, would be the uh, pizza oven and the uh, smoker. Uh, those would come out of the resale reserve. There are other things too that are kind of behind the scenes that nobody's really, you, you don't really see unless you're taking a <coughs> tour of the kitchen. And I, the one I'm going to mention is <laughs> Tim knows is the fish file. <laughs> but this came up at every finance committee meeting for about two years. Remember, we meet at least 12 times a year, and this fish file just, just never quite made the cut. But we finally had a tour. What's a fish file? It's like a file cabinet full of ice and fish, but it's critical, it's expensive, but really what it does is it allows Chef Liam to uh, keep fish fresh longer, say that 20 times fast. It also, but more importantly really what it does is it allows him to control his cost of goods sold. And that's his mission. And that's part of providing the member experience for us. So that's a little background of what we use these fees for. Uh, we also have the stipulation that we try to maintain, we keep the balance in the fund at 25000 We can go to the board and ask permission to dip below that if you know the pizza oven comes up for sale. And we know we have five closings that are going to close this month, so we have some money coming in. So there's always a little bit of a cushion in there. So the next is, yeah, okay, here's the historical trend for our club by year from 2012 through uh, the fiscal year, from number one, September 30th fiscal year. It's a little busy, but you can see this is the, every month how many uh, sales were closed within the community. And over the last six years, we've averaged about 46 resales a year. You know, from a low of 25 in 2012 to a high of 60 in 2013, and we're at 55 in this last fiscal year that closed. Now, the other thing we looked at we decided everyone on the finance committee, we said, oh, well, this, we don't have any new members. It's just everyone we know keeps moving within Stonebridge, which is absolutely not the case. We just happen to know all those people. So I asked uh, Stephanie to go through with Erica and do a determination to the best we could. We may have missed one or two, but I think it's fairly accurate. How many uh, reset of our internal, how many of you are moving within Stonebridge? So, for example, in fiscal 2017, 55 resales occurred, six of which were people moving within the community, three of which in the prior year, et cetera. So it's running anywhere from you know, six to 14 percent or so of the average are actually come, uh, people moving uh, around the community. And you can also see the trend in what we've collected for resale. And again, it's based on dues, so 25 percent of your dues. Um, so it's gone from 1442 to 1785 for the last fiscal year. And you can also, she's given you the math there about what that generates. You know, we hit a high this year of $98,000 collected for resale, 76,000 the year before, and a low of 36,000 back in fiscal 2012. So 
So the next chart, I, you know, okay, this is, you may have to take this home with your reading glasses and some better light, but this is looking at data that we collected last April, which is when the Finance Committee did their deliberations to come up with a proposal. We looked at all of the bundled communities that are around us. The first one, so there's a section called Comparable Clubs, Vasari, Copperleaf, Vanderbilt, Worthington, et cetera. And then we have, quote, other clubs that are maybe a little further north or south or have different types of memberships. What we are looking for here is, let's find all the bundled clubs that are relatively close to our size, roughly 800 doors, one 18-hole golf course, you know, a similar amenity structure, similar kinds of housing stock, too. Everyone has a Manchester, everyone has a Carrington, you know, in terms of square footage. So we went out and looked, and some of this was information that Tim gathered. Uh, some I'm still being stalked by various real estate agents when I'm trying to trick them into giving me what the resale for some community <laughs> is. But we went out and looked at all of these clubs. Now, again, this is really last year's data. The other thing we looked at, and Tim was very helpful on this, was some clubs are very forthcoming as to how they calculate it, and others it's a, it's a mystery that Tim had to sort of ferret out through the club manager as to how these things were calculated and was it a formula. And you can see that many of these are actually just determined by the board on an annual basis. They're not, there isn't a formula. But in all cases, they are all significantly greater than what we are charging, $1,748.47. Now, as of last year, you can see uh, the comparable clubs, and again, these are clubs that we would benchmark ourselves in a survey in terms of our amenities, our cost of ownership. Again, similar number of doors. Uh, I think they're all in Collier County, et cetera. The average resale fee last year was $3,585, and the median was $3,136. And the median, as you know, is just half or above that and half or below that. So, we were like kind of trying to reach up to touch bottom because we were half of the of the uh, average of the medium. So that that showed us that we we certainly had some room to be competitive in this area. And again, we looked at all these other clubs too, where the uh, fee was determined by the board. But again, they were either bigger or they had different classes of membership. They weren't necessarily all bundled. So the next thing I took a look at to see, does this resale fee have any impact on the bearing on the value of your unit? When you come into a bundled community, whether you buy a million dollar home or a $200,000 condo, you're gonna pay the exact same resale fee. It's not based on square footage or anything else. And that was why I, we looked at, last April anyway, uh, publicly available data, what was the listing price on the market for the smallest unit any of these communities had in terms of square footage. And as I say, the data that we looked at was everybody, everybody has the same variety of housing stock that we do. And again, whether you were buying a 1,200 square foot unit in Worthington, you're, for $144,000, you're gonna pay $4,860 at closing as a one-time transfer, uh, one-time resale fee. I would also note too, I started to update this. The only one I, I got as far as copper leaf, and even though we said last year that that was a 1% of the sale price with a cap, I can see they've already raised that to 3,500. So maybe they've made a change in their in their declaration over the past year. So um, anyway, just I offer that out there. It seems to me the empirical evidence would say it doesn't have any value. It doesn't have any impact on the value of your unit or the value if you're thinking of selling your unit. So. So you can look at that more closely under better light. Now, the next slide I have here is, again, what, what are we looking to do with these monies? I talked about some of the things that we have done in prior years um, with the resale fee. And this is what was proposed and approved at the August member meeting as part of the 2018 fiscal year uh, capital budget. And this, these are, we call it capital, but it's really, it's the resale capital budget. You can see we have 12 items on the list in the resale, pri the priority is management's priority as to where they think it falls into the scheme of what they'd like to do. And a couple things I'm gonna point out here. While Sandy was giving her presentation on communications and talking about digital signage, well, that's one thing that's on here. It's actually priority number two, $4,000. Uh, the master site plan is in there. Um, there's all kinds of what we call small wares, things in the kitchen, 
Uh, the outside extra furniture for the bistro. I don't know what a vertical broiler is. I guess it's different than a horizontal broiler, but it's kind of a unique one. So, um, and it's a whole lot less expensive than the fish file. But, and as you can see, these things go up in, in uh, kind of desire and price. The biggest one out there, and if Eric were here, he'd give you a, a fabulous four color presentation on the, the clock that he would like to install in the dragon <laughs> And it's, it's gonna look fabulous. However, now we come to the problem of math. So the wish list here is $126,400 for this year. We estimated that we would end the year, let's call it 48,000 uh, in our reserve uh, resale fund. And if we, we take an average of, say, 46 is the average number of resells a year times our fee structure, that would generate another 83000 or so. So we would end the year with a fund balance of $1,700. Remember, I said we have to keep 25000 in the fund. So Eric, sorry, no dice on the clock. <laughs> but I think he knows that. So. Anyway, this is, uh, I, I just point this out there. This is a, a you know, process that we go through. It is voted on by the membership. And the real wish list is probably as long as my arm out there that we never even you know, get up to. If, if it isn't something that we're going to generate the fees for, it's probably not going to make the list. So um, one other thing I would point out, I don't have it on here. Someone asked this question. Well, if you spend money out of the resale reserve, eventually it goes into the capital reserve and you have to reserve for it. And indeed, that is true. Items that we buy, individual items costing greater than $2,500, we do capitalize. So um, when I look at the buffet and equipment, that there's probably not an item in there. It's a million different items of chafing dishes and things like that. So yes, if you make a big ticket purchase that you would actually have to uh, you know, repair or replace over whatever its useful life is that would impact your master reserve uh, slightly going forward. So now, the moment you're all waiting for. Okay, the proposed change. First, I'm just gonna talk about the steps. As I said, the board asked the Finance Committee last fall to take another look at the, uh, the whole resale fee structure and what, what could we do. As I say, we looked at the competitive landscape we also took a look at how other clubs charged it, and as a committee, we felt comfortable saying it really should have a formula based, as opposed to just the discretion of the board. And as a finance person, I like a formula because it's predictable, and I can run an average resale, and I kind of can know how much money it's gonna generate, and it's a lot easier to set a budget. Um, I also thought it was easier for the membership that there was a formula there. And clearly, our formula was a whole lot lower than anyone else's. So we had a quite a robust, extended discussion at the Finance Committee level about this. And then from there, uh, we sent it over to Legal and Governance, because it requires a change of the master declaration. So they worked it over and sent it out to our outside legal counsel for his proposal in terms of the wording, the change that would go along with it. So what we came up with, uh, the committee came up with the changing basically the resale fee from 25% of the annual dues to 50% of the annual dues and master-based assessment. So there would be, essentially would be a doubling of where we currently are. Think about that, that puts us right at the median of all of the clubs. You know, we're not, I, we're, we, we would be in what I call the anonymous middle. Nobody's really gonna know this. We're just kind of right out there in the middle. Um, the, also, the, there's another discussion we had. The proposed language does contain um, an important exception for existing owners, which you know, we do have some people that move around within the community. And so that's the next chart. This is actually the legal language uh, of what we have proposed, what the uh, Steve Falk, our attorney, came up with. But cutting to the chase, really what it means is if you own a unit within Stonebridge, or you own one within 90 days and you're purchasing another one, you get a break on the resale fee. And instead of paying the proposed 50%, you would pay 10%. So, and more importantly, no um, lifetime limit. So you can move within the community with abandon <laughs> over and over and over. So this is, if it, basically the way I would look at a resale fee is no one in this room is gonna pay it. It's for new owners coming in as part of the closing costs. And the only way it's gonna impact an existing member is if you were thinking of 
you know, going up or down in terms of your housing stock and thinking of having to pay this again, you would actually be, if you want to hold off until we get the vote, you know, you might <laughs> save a little bit of money there. So you can see it doesn't really change the numbers that much in terms of the, uh, the monies that we would collect from the resale fee, but we felt that it was an important, um, more I guess a psychological benefit for existing owners that might be thinking of moving. So, uh, the last thing I have that's not in the slide, I neglected to put it on. This does require a vote because it is a change to our master declaration, hence the um, engagement with the Legal and Governance Committee. So, the Finance Committee took it to uh, the board after Legal and Governance had uh, done the language for us and the board accepted our proposal of the change to 50%, and they accepted the proposal that it would be go on the ballot in Jan January when we do the election for the uh, new board. So it will require a two-thirds majority of all owners. There's 799 owners here, and I think 780 of them are not in this room. So <laughs> please spread the word because the way our, our documents are written, if you do not cast a vote, it is counted as a no vote. So we really would like, hopefully everyone would see the benefit in this. This benefits all the membership. Um, it adds to our experience here at Stonebridge and um, uh, does everything that we're looking to do in terms of our mission and our vision. And most importantly, it doesn't cost us anything. So, with that, any questions? Over here for Tim. Yes. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I think you know, getting this out to the community, one of the important things would be to make people understand that as long as these fees are not an overall problem for Southwest Florida, right. it's not a problem for us right. if we're right in the middle. It just isn't. Good. And could I sign you up to be on that committee? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, we have discussed how um, it would be great to have some ambassadors to talk through this, that we're happy to answer any questions on it, but I think that was an important point we found when we just looked at what everyone else was charging, that it really, empirically, it can't be an impacting your, your value of your and I think, I think you know, letting people know that it really isn't a problem is going to be important because they're going to see this fee right. increase and immediately the knee-jerk reaction is, right. this is a problem, and it's not. No. It's not. It's a fee for everybody but us. Right. Yes? I will also explain when you send this out exactly what this resale fund is dedicated to be used for. Good point. You know, like my cushion analogy, it took two years. To every, every finance meeting I'd say, Tim, how are you doing on the cushions? He's like, they're down on the list. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, there, anything else, Sandy? The other thing is, it is in every community in Collins County. And, and in Lee County, too. Right. Yeah, so I, I looked at some up in some Lee County. not listed, but it's every community. Right. So it seems to be written in everybody's master declaration that you will collect this contribution, so. Any other questions? I'm trying to find Dan, thank you. So spread the word. Good job. Right. Thank you. I, and actually, I think it's pretty common in any homeowners association, even up north, you're, when you're doing a closing, you're going to see a capital contribution on the uh, sheet from the new owner. So a lot of people should be used to it. Um, how many people attended the uh, focus group? How many people did not attend the focus group? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, the Master Site Plan Committee hosted uh, 10 focus group sessions over the end of October. Well, no, actually the beginning of November. First, third, and fourth, I think it was. Uh, we were fortunate to have over 200 members, I think it's 207, uh, attend the focus groups uh, to learn about what the Master Site Plan Committee had been considering and to participate in that process that the committee's going through, which is to evaluate uh, different opportunities to address the four areas that our, our member survey indicated were the priorities with our members, and that was the uh, parking, increased parking availability, uh, expanded 
informal or casual dining facilities, including the bistro, uh, expanded fitness center, and uh, the possibility of a resort-style swimming pool. Those were the four priorities that the survey identified. And the committee has been looking at that and came forward with what would be the first two items being addressed. The parking lot expansion, which would add approximately 50 spaces to our parking lot in a very clever design that the engineers came up with. And uh, the expansion of the bistro facility, not necessarily, there's, a, there's three options. One is not actually an expansion of the bistro facility, it's expanding the air conditioned portion of the bistro uh, by bumping out the wall to where the, this overhang uh, exists and uh, adding an awning to cover uh, some of the tables that are now outside and exposed. And then two other options which would add a um, kind of a, a separate bar facility and additional seating. All of the proposals also include the a bump out of the bulkhead here to add some additional space for these improvements down the line for possible bocce courts. Uh, it would take the uh, bulkhead, which, which is due for replacement, I think in about three or four years, uh, <laughs> the, actually by bumping out the bulkhead, we would reduce the amount of bulkhead we need and reduce the expense of that replacement, uh, but it would add land for us uh, to do some of these uh, expansions that we're talking about. So, with that input, the uh, committee meets again this Wednesday uh, to discuss that and um, move toward a, a more fleshed out plan, if you will, which would include things that a lot of people wanted to hear about, like price. Uh, so that's what we'll be doing. We do think that 207, we were happy with that number, but uh, we also think we're going to have at least one additional focus group in January, when pretty much everybody is back, even though between the cocktail parties and the party last night, it seems like everybody's back. Um, so that's where we're going to be going. We anticipate that after that uh, January focus group meets that we'll probably be in a position to move toward uh, town hall meetings for actual proposals with dollar signs on them. So uh, to go to the members and have some town halls and then we would do a straw poll for member preferences with regard to what uh, course of action we would take. So that's what, where we are with the Master Site Plan Committee. Any questions on that? Great. I really do appreciate your coming. I would anticipate that at the very least we've recruited at least nine or ten new committee members. I'm certain of that uh, because who wouldn't want to work with this group? Okay? Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thanks.